Hi there VC, it's Steve Whitty here with a new, new video. Um, yes, it is Monday morning. I didn't um, do a video yesterday. I've got this week off work, so I thought um, give me a chance to just do, let's um, say, just do maybe could catch up and watching some videos, for instance, but also um, catch up on, on some listens. I know I've got Steve Carlson's Carlson's um, uh, contest to uh, enter, and I've only got about a week and a half to think about it. And it, God, it's it's difficult because I, his contest is is actually quite difficult for me to come up with. I know others have done good entries, but not that I've watched any. I um, just haven't had to, I really had the time to watch videos recently, so apologies for that. So, on, on a first thought, but thank you for those who watched and commented on my video last week. Um, I know there's a couple of us that have uh, picked up on James's thread, some well known guys. Um, Beetle Brad has certainly done one, um, and. So, so I'm sure others have done it as well. It, it, and it, it's quite an interesting topic, and you know, as I say, it, I'll just to, to, toss my opinion in there just to see what people think. And I had some quite interesting replies to it, particularly on the album I showed. Anyway, this is a recent listens video. I haven't done one of these in a couple of weeks, and rather than just number it as number 21, I think it would have been, I've decided. Um, I've categorised it, I've listened to a lot recently, so this is video is going to be showing albums, and there is a CD in there, of artists that were around in the 60s, not all the albums were released in the 60s, there's some comps in there which came out in the 70s, so like for example, the first album I'm going to show you, and uh, this is Amen Corner's Greatest Hits, featuring Andy Fairweather Lowe. Now, this was released in 1977, and this is probably on the back that Andy, Andy Fairweather had some solo hits. It's on, it's through Immediate, it's on the Immediate label, and there were quite a few reissues at that time, They re, and, and NEMS, I think they had the, the rights to the Immediate cat back catalogue, and they issued, I think, quite a few of their artists at that point. Um, so it's got the hits on here, but it's actually quite an interesting album. It's a very good comp. If you see it, I, I recommend you pick it up. So it's, singles wise, it's got If Paradise Is Half As Nice, which was their number one hit single. Um, Hello Susie, which is their cover of Roy Wood's song. And you've got the Duva cover version of Get Back and The Wait, which was very interesting, actually quite good. But the last four tracks on here are live tracks. Um, so it's so fine. High in the Sky, another hit single for um, Gin House and Ben Me Shake Me, which is probably, even though it wasn't number one, it's probably the most best known track. Um, certainly worth checking out. They were a band that were from South Wales, I believe, from Cardiff. I think Cardiff or Swansea, I'm not sure where. Um, very popular, late 60s, particularly pop, pop type. Um, sort of like a soul with the horns, I think one of the guys actually ended up, I can't think who, ended up initially managing um, Guns N' Roses. Next up, this is um, Big Brother and the Holding Company, Cheap Frills. Um, this released in 1968. Obviously, it's an album that I think most people are aware of. This is a Canadian pressing. On the Columbia label, and I suppose you'd call it a Columbia. If I get it out, two I. I think it's called over here. Columbia was it's CBS, and they didn't go out. It's they did had a different approach. So pop rock and pop was tend to be on the orange label. I think classical was might be red. And the soundtrack was on blue. Um, I mean, what can I say about the album? Um, it was the last to feature Janis Joplin. She left later on in the year. And this is really on the back of her their performance at the Monterey Pop Festival. Um, it is sometimes uh, it's dis been described mistaken for a live album. There's a lot of crowd noise in there. But it's, in fact, it's a studio album, apart from Ball and Chain. That was the track that was recorded live. Um, 
it's a it's a good album. You know, obviously Janice is in fine uh, in fine voice. Spetl. Um would they? Would, who knows what they could have achieved if she stayed with the band? But it was quite obvious watching Monterey that they had the star, and that was the and that's who Columbia wanted to um, promote at the time, um, and carried on, but uh, never had never quite the same for them. Next one is another comp. This is Chris Farlow's Mr. Soulful. Now, this is an 80s comp released in 1986. Chris Farlow, one of the great voices of English pop. And then this came out on sort of like a, a, a reissue label, Showcase. Um, and it's through Castle uh, Communications, who are who were quite a major re reissue label in the, in the 80s. It doesn't feature any. It doesn't feature out of time. It's not not on there. Which was his number one hit single, which was penned by Jagger and Richards. But it does t feature two other versions of his songs. Um, you've got uh, "I'm Free" and "Paint It Black." His version of that also does his version of "Handbags and Glad Rags" um, in the midnight midnight hour. I've been loving you too long. Reach out. I'll be there, Mister Pitiful. Um, think um really great voice he went off he went on to the lead singer in coliseum afterwards um and yeah, i know springsteen's a big fan and i think at the time after he, he um had, had a bit of success relaunching gary us bonds he wanted to reach out for, to chris farlow to see if they could do something never nothing never really came of that unfortunately Next album, uh, The Capo by Love, um, not released in 1966, their second album. This is probably standard fare in the VC, particularly in the States. Um, seven and Seven Years is the best known track, covered by Alice Cooper, Rush, amongst others. Um, it's a mixture of psych rock and baroque pop, um, and very much that baroque pop sort of hints at the direction that went with their next album the classic forever changes um not a bad album itself this is a reissued copy it's got a bit of a mark on it but i got it quite cheap so i did it up there you go it's on the electra with the with the moth on it or butterfly because it's a butterfly because it's got colors on it Good album, all the same. So, you know, it's pleased to have that in the collection. Next, the Pentangle. The Pentangle's probably a better name. Um, this is Basket of Light, released in 1969. This was a top five, and this is on a transatlantic label. This is Showing the labels to that, but this is like an original on the transatlantic label. There you go. Um, as I said, released in 1969, it was their biggest selling, but the highest charting album in the UK, reached the top five. The song, lead track on here, Light Flight, um, was used as it was a, almost a hit single, it hit. It almost hit the top 40 in the UK. It was used as the theme for a BBC drama series called Take Three Girls, which was very popular. And it was a bit groundbreaking. We'd only just really seen the introduction of colour television in the UK at that point, and this was that was the first drama series the BBC filmed in colour. To you Americans, it must seem like we were living... You had colour TV a lot, 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 lot earlier than us. It must feel like we're you're dealing with someone living in the, <laughs> in the Stone Ages. Moving on to 1968. This is free. Tons of sob, their debut album. Um, it's When you listen to this, it's hard to suspend belief that how young the band were. It is a reissue on the Pink Rim label. As I said, you know, how young the band were at the time, none of them were, had it reached 20. They were all under 20 years age, and Andy Fraser at that time was just 16. Um, produced by um, Chris Blackwell, uh, signed and Guy Stevens produced this album. And... Just 
Excuse me, the screensaver just came on while I was doing this. Um, I've just got to keep my mood to do this. Um, yes, as I was saying, Guy Stevens was assigned to produce the album. Um, and Chris Blackwell only signed a very limited budget. It's hard to believe that this album was recorded for the budget of £800. Um, it's barely an hour now in, my, in some studios. Um, and it does sound very rough and ready, but that's I think adds to the charm of the album. Um, you've got on here the tracks on here. Um, uh, Walking my shadow. Uh, do a cover of the Hunter. I'm a mover, which was a staple of their live acts. Um, and just absolutely really corking blues out well I, I did rank them in my top i think number three my top 20 british acts of all time so i was really pleased to find that crikey i don't want to get these out of order next and i picked this up in hmv it was going cheap in there so this is Dr. John's The Night Tripper, uh, uh, the Night Tripper his Greek debut album, Greek Greek, also released in 1968. This is a 2013 reissue. Uh, obviously, we passed away recently, and I realised I hadn't really got any... You know, I was aware of some of his stuff, I'm particularly aware of this album, but I didn't have any to own. So I picked up this, as I said, his debut album. It really does capture the spirits of New Orleans, um, Rhythm blues fused with the psychedelic rock, which was at at that point. Um, even though the musicians were from New Orleans, in fact, the album was apparently recorded in California. Um, obviously, the best known track on here is "I Walk on Gilded Slint Spinners," where Caris Hunt, I think, had a hit in the UK with it, um, and Paul Weller, amongst others, as, as um, Covered it. What's going to make people try and find some more? I suspect it's going to be, they're going to be as rare old vinyl. Um, Doctor John is going to be as rare as pulling teeth. So, you know, it, it, I'm pleased I've got this. Now I said I've got one CD to show, and this is the sound of Fury, Billy Fury. Um, it's very easy to forget that there was a pop scene pre-Beatles and this album, The Sound of Fury, absolutely represents probably the best pre-Beatles album. Billy Fury was born Ronald Witcherly in 1940 in Liverpool um, and he, because of his looks, he, 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 he's, um, well I was going to say, he's... Um, as a child, he suffered really bad at ill health, which dogged him all his life. Um, he was picked up by Larry Parnes, who changed his name to Billy Fury, and he was put on his his staple of acts of like teenage heartthrobs that would satisfy the need of the teenage girl, uh, the audience at the time, and then just disappear. Difference with Billy Fury was that he could write his own stuff. And the reason this album is so important is this album it's, it was originally released in 1960. It was a 10 inch album and of 10 tracks, which were all written by Billy Fury or under his own name, or sometimes he used the name Wilbur Wilberforce as a pseudonym just to hide the fact he'd written them. And you know, this is a 40th anniversary two CD uh, uh, reissue, which I picked up recently. It's in absolutely immaculate condition, um, case and everything. It's a really corking album. Interestingly enough, um, drummer on this album was Andy White, who ended up drumming on Love Me Do, on the Beatles' Love Me Do. Um, next year will be the 60th anniversary. It would be nice to see this reissued on vinyl as a 10 inch vinyl as it was originally meant to be, not put all the gubbins of them. Um, I mean, the side ones, the CD one, it's a two CD set. CD one's the original mono album, and CD two's the stereo. They've done it in stereo, mixed it in stereo, and then some extra tracks on it. But that's disc one, as good as rock and roll as you're going to get. And I still, still staked. This is the best Beatles, uh, pre Beatles album of the lot. So 
that was the CD. Next up, this is Manfred Mann's The Greatest. Manfred Mann, uh, Music for Pleasure comp released in 1972, and this really focuses on the Paul Jones era. And there's another one that focuses on the Mike Darbo era out there, which if I see it, I'll pick it up. Um, yeah, it's got here yeah, pretty all the hits, Pretty Flamingo, Man in the Middle. Well, pretty Flamingo, if you, and you all know that Jack Bruce had joined, was a member, briefly a member of Manfred Mann, he played bass on there. Um, oh no, my, my baby, shalala, if you got to go, go now, do what diddy diddy. Um, we've got, it does it, the cracking version we've got on our on, on our side, um, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, just some of the great singles that they did. They were part of the blues, but, but boom, but um, sort of tw tigged up tw twig that they couldn't really, they weren't very good writers at that point. They couldn't match what wasn't required, so they did, chose good covers. Ooh, let's have a quick slurp. This is a pineapple coconut banana smoothie. Bob Dylan bringing it all back home. Um, 1965, year of my birth. Fifth studio album, two sides, half one electric, one acoustic. Um, so the electric side is um, Subterranean Homesick Blues, Maggie's Farm, um, the best two tracks on there. And then on the acoustic side, you've got Mr. Tambourine Man, Gates of Eden, It's All Right Ma, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. That's as good a side as you're going to get in, in music, uh, say, side two. Groundbreaking album. It's sort of alien. It stopped. Um, he was starting to abandon the protest song. Uh, movement and the fact he was recording electric started to further alienate him from his his original core audience of folk um, and it, and it, and obviously brings up to Highway 61 revisited and the, and the like but uh, it's, it's an album if you haven't got you should have Next, and this is a recent reissue. This is Mott the Hoople's self titled debut album. Um, released in 1969. Um, produced, again, produced by Guy Stevens, who produced the three tons of salt. Um, they were very much his prodigies. He, he just saw them live and loved them. I mean, so keen to get hold of a copy of this. Originals are just that stupid price. This came out, I got it through Amazon, and I'm having me beef with Amazon at the moment, but and they've even replicated the pink, original pink island label. Um, corking album, you know, you can see where they were coming from. Loud, boisterous rock. Um, they were opening up with a version of You Really Got Me. Um, and then they cover, they do a Sonny Bono song, Laugh At Me. It's our first three tracks on here are covers. Um, this is absolutely, it, it, as I said, it's a corking album. We're glad I got this. I brought Wildlife, reissue of Wildlife. Um, I'll show you that later in another video. As I say, I'm so glad that all the Island Records uh, albums, four al albums, were released in, uh, as. Uh, on, on vinyl just a couple of months ago so they're out there if you need to get hold of them when i put this on instagram i said this is a masterpiece i found myself finally found a uk copy of this i've got a new zealand pressing um strange but the reason i'm so pleased i've got this um the cover breaks up it's on track Obviously, my original didn't have the booklet, you know, the sort of lyric booklet that comes with it. I don't think there's any much more needs to be said. It's a masterpiece. Rock opera, you know, whether it's the first, you, know, you could argue SF Sorrow might be considered to be the first um, rock opera, but it's still a corking album all the same. Uh, I've got, you know, you can't go wrong with this. Uh, who? Tommy. Shorty Fame, uh, Fame at Last, his second solo album. Um, 
it's starting to move away a little bit. Um, it's starting to move away a little bit from the his, his Hammond sound, sort of his R rhythm blues roots, which was done on his debut album Rhythm Blues at the Flamingo. Um, but some great stuff. Do a version of Green Onions on here. Um, or else. Uh, Pride and Joy is on here as well. I'm in the mood for love. So it, mo it start moving away with, from the. It, it's quite telling that the Blue Flames are not on all the out on all on all tracks. Produced by Ian Samwell. But any Georgie Fine, so I mean, some of it's quite expensive, quite rare. So it's worth picking up if you see it. Took plunge recently and I got myself a copy of the Rolling Stones, their Satanic Majesty's Request, the 1967, their Psych album. Um, some bands that period it suited them. For others, like the Stones, it just didn't. It, it, I wouldn't say it didn't work, but it just wasn't really them. Um, they weren't touring at the time. I don't know, maybe they had too much time on their hands. Got the lithograph there. Yeah. Um, and it's... There's some good tracks on here. 2000 Man I like. Um, She's a Rainbow. 2000 Light Years From Home. Um, but the, I, th I don't know, it, it doesn't feel like a Stones album, in my opinion. I know there's going to be some people out there who's going to go, whoa, it's just, it's just as valid as any other Stones album. Listening to it, I'm glad I've got it. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm comparing it to other albums that period, and it doesn't fit. It's, uh, it's almost like Mutton Dressed Up as a Lamb. Just two more albums to go. Um, well, this has been a long video. I finally managed to get hold of a mono copy of The Beatles' Hard Day's Night. Uh, I was missing two monos for my collection. Um, and this sounds much better than my Diagostini um, uh, vinyl collection uh, prep album. And I mentioned when I did this at the time that something about the opening chord sort of like faded in. Whereas here, it's the proper bang into into the song. Um, James Griffiths has said this is probably one of their most, probably most important album. I probably would agree. It's self-written. It had to work for a soundtrack. It doesn't sound like a soundtrack. That's that is. Uh, I, I always hark back to Queen's Flash Gordon, which what sounded like a soundtrack. This doesn't, a lot bit like Help. It doesn't sound like a soundtrack. It's an album. It, it, it stands out as an album in its own right. Obviously, you don't really need to tell me what the songs are on there. It's just, it's just a blooming corking great album. I said I needed to to complete the mono, my mono, Beatles monos. They're not in great states, but I did find a white album. In one home. Poster, it is in not in the best of Nick. It's obviously been on the wall and it's probably seen better days and the four photos are not there. However, and my 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 mono, if I can read the number is six four three six four two nine nine. And the record itself, it's a top up you, you, you access it from the top. There. See the catalog. You see the catalog number. It's not in the. There you go. So I was pleased. I did pay a little bit for this. This is my sort of like flight of fancy. There, and I thought, oh, you know, I never thought I'd see one actually a mono copy of this. So when the fact that one came was floating around, I thought, you know what, I like that. Thank you very much. I don't think really need to go on about the album. Everyone's gone on about it, 50 years. Um, it, whoever had it, loved all the album, even played Revolution 9 on it. Um, no, it's, it's a cooking album, classic album of its time. Um, my favourite tracks on here, for what it's worth. Uh, I do like um, Back in the USR, Birthday, Hell. I like the more rockiest, uh, the 
sort of more guitar based sounding stuff on there. Um, yeah, great album. So there you go, VC. Those are my recent listens of the 60s. Um, as I said, I've got a week off work. The sun is shining at the moment, which is good. I'll do a bit of tidying up. I've got, I think I've got something coming, being delivered today, so I've got to stay in a little bit. Um, so, wherever you get up to this week, VC, hope you have a good one. Um, if you're new to the channel and you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Thumbs up, thumbs down, love the interaction. And feel free to comment, I will try and get back to you. Now, until the next time, uh, VC, and it might be another video this week. Take care of yourselves, keep spinning, more importantly, keep smiling.